Okay. So the idea, the idea of this was to kind of try to summarize all of, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about um, with regards to how you go from idea generation and analysis stage of a trade to finally actually executing a trade, right? And, and managing your risk and managing money, right? So the idea was to try and come up with a one pager where you could use that as reference to um, just sort of help you, right? And just check that you've kind of covered all the bases and thought things through properly, yeah? So we, um, so we start with idea generation, yeah? I mean, from my perspective, I, I was like, you know, from a broad perspective, what are the main things that people use to come up with a trading idea? Okay, what types of analysis? So obviously you've got fundamental analysis where we talk about things like valuation, stock valuations or whatever, you might have various valuation models that you use, discounted cash flow, whatever it is. Um, and then you might look at macro data trends if you're trying to model more like economies and, and more macro instruments. Or then you could go for thematic where you're looking at various themes that are longer term structural themes that you're trying to participate in. Um, you know, like whatever tech, innovation, that type of thing. And like I said, and that kind of ties into the last one, long term growth, innovation, disruption, right? So if you certainly for your long term pension portfolio, you'll be looking for companies that have that long-term growth profile where you can just park some cash in it and come back in 10 years and, and you, you expect that to multiply quite nicely, right? So that, that's how I look at fundamental. So fundamental analysis, and then that naturally, if you look at where the arrows take you, they take you to a time horizon which sits typically much longer, right? So in the, I've said one year plus, but really, it's quite feasible that that fundamental analysis is for things where you'll be in a trade for five to 10 years or even more than that, right? So that's how I thought about that. Um, in terms of other types of analysis you might do is more technical stuff. Um, obviously charts and indicators, very commonly used. You might be looking for momentum hunting strategies. Uh, you might be looking for mean reversion strategies. Again, you can be using charts and you know ranges and things like that to help you with that and then stat arb so all of these type of trades or strategies kind of fall within that type of analysis yeah they tend to be a bit more variable in their in their time horizon um so obviously you can have the super short term where we're talking hours or days and you know it could be even shorter than hours right it could be seconds or minutes um for the super high frequency stuff but you know the hours to days is more the day trading or some of the other algos that are around uh, will be playing in that space. Um, and then you've also got the more swing trading styles, right? Or the, the medium term, which might stay weeks to months in terms of high time horizons. So swing trading, more like the type of trading I like to do, or CTA trend following, right? So you'll be using momentum indicators, driving your trend following strategies that are more systematic, but those trades will be a bit more medium term in nature as well. Yeah. And then lastly, I've put, and, and this is not an exhaustive list, right? This is just more what kind of came to mind for me. Um, and, uh, and that third sort of type of analysis with more catalyst or event driven, I called it, right? So you're, it's more a specific macro catalyst or even micro catalyst. If you're talking about an earnings announcement that you're playing for, um, you might be positioning for a specific known event that has got a that, that you you know the date already in advance. Um, clearly, on the macro, it will be more elections and politics. Those type of events seem to be impacting the macro a lot these days, uh, and also central bank policy meetings are, are huge for markets these days. Right, so that's another form of analysis that you may have done to try to predict the outcome of that event that is known to be happening on a certain date in the future. And you'll have your own sort of reasoning or models behind that. Um, so in that space, the type of strategies, you know, that people do risk ARB, like merger ARB type strategies, you know, that's a, that's a big one. 
that is that type of catalyst driven or event driven trading uh, is quite big in the hedge fund world. Um, event volatility trading. So, you know, we talked about that, right, where you can, you can look at the price of an event from the options market, from the vol market, and you can then decide whether or not that event is, is the right price and you can trade around the volatility of that event. Uh, and that's where op the options market comes in, right? And you can, you know, benefit from being right or wrong on that, right? So clearly the VIX, VIX term structure trade that we that we broke down uh, a week or two ago, that, that falls into that sort of bracket. Yeah. Any questions on that so far? No, we'll a bit more about this guy. So then, so then I've got this sort of ellipse down here where I've brought in, you know, the next thing to think about once you know your time horizon and you kind of know what's driving your idea and what your idea is based on, um, is you need to kind of incorporate this, this whole area down here, right, where you need to look at what the volatility of the asset is and what the scenarios, what the realistic scenarios are of the asset within the time horizon that you're looking basically right and the type of things you'll be looking at to guide you there will be these things that are around around there like you know implied vol average true range of the asset what are the big picture trends of the asset so you can look zoom out on the longer term charts where where's this thing been where's it heading look at the elliott wave setup as we've discussed that kind of helps you with those scenarios um, are there any major tail risks to the scenario, right? Are, are there things that in the time frame that you're looking, are there any, uh, what, what type of things could really derail and be a big tail risk to your scenario, right? You need to factor those in account, into account. And then you can look at these Bollinger Bands, obviously, to give you a bit of a sense for where spot is versus the average vol of that asset. And also Fibonacci levels. You can build some Fibonacci confluence levels to get a sense for where, where things are, where things may be headed, right? Levels of importance to be aware of, basically, right? So, so I would do, I would do all of that, and then it goes to the to the black box with or with the with the risk management side. You know, this is where you are now having to think about stock placement, sizing, target price, and risk reward, right? So all of the bits in the ellipse have kind of helped you with find, think about where your stock placement should be and where your target price might be. Those two things then give you an idea of what your risk reward is. And if that risk reward is adequate, then you now have to think about sizing, right? So now I know where, I remember it's about, for me, it's all about trying to put a stop where you, are happy to say, okay, I was wrong on this view, right? So, you know, clearly if, if you've got a fundamental analysis and you put a stop 2% away from the market, that's completely inconsistent, right? Because your fundamental analysis is probably, is probably something that, you know, the time horizon should be at least a year, maybe more for, right? You don't know when that fundamental picture is going to come into fruition and play out. So you need to look at the context of that asset and say, what does that do in a year typically, right? How much, and, and that's why those fundamental views tend to be less sort of trading views with stop loss. And they tend to be much more asset allocation or pension fund or you know, long only style views where you don't actually necessarily need a stop. You just allocate an amount of capital that you're comfortable with to reflect that view, right? And you, know, you, might, you might have a stop, but it might be, you know, it might be miles away or something fundamentally will have to have changed in the, in the story or the company for you to then exit that position. Right. So it won't be necessarily price level based stock, but it will just be, you'll be reevaluating if your model tells you something different about the stock because you know, whatever there's been a new piece of news, then you take that into account and maybe you change your view. Right. Uh, but on the more trading style on the more technicals and shorter term, medium term stuff, this stuff's much more relevant where you have to be realistic about where this could realistically go in the time horizon that you're thinking. And you want your stop to be in a place where yes, you're happy to hold your hands up and say, I was wrong. So I, I'm out of the view now, right? I'm out of that trade. And then you size it based on 
whatever equity you want to put at risk in your account per trade. And, and generally a, a right approach there is to, you know, either just put the same amount of equity at risk per trade or have some sort of checklist system or ranking system to say, you know, if a trade, say, say you've got a list of criteria that, that have to be met for you to think a trade is interesting, right? Let's say there's five, just for argument's sake, let's say there's five criteria, right? And all five boxes are being ticked, then that's a super high conviction trade for you, which then means you should put a large, the largest amount of equity at risk that you are willing to put per trade can go on that trade, right? But if, if you're only ticking three out of five boxes, but you still want to do the trade for whatever reason, then maybe you do less equity at risk, right? So that might be a way for you to quantify and, and, and systematically get a framework where you like, if all the boxes are ticked, then okay, I go to maximum allocation. But if only a few boxes are ticked, then, but I still want to do the trade because I, you know, I don't know if I'm, I don't want to miss out, let's say necessarily, if, if the trade does look interesting, then you maybe just put less equity at risk on that trade if not all the boxes are ticked, right? So it allows you to, have a bit of a ranking system for your for your trades that you're screening for. Right? Um, so then, once you've got the risk management, no, I'm sorry, is there a question on that? No, yeah. Um, do you, do you, can you give us a sort of example of how this bullet point uh, would look like? Well, it's very I mean, personal, or is any an example might be you know if you're if you've got a trade that is with the trend, for example, right? then that will be a box tick. Whereas you might have another trade that is trying to play a sort of bit of a mean reversion or, you know, Bollinger Band or whatever, but it's against the trend, right? So, so, there'll, be, so there'll be counteracting signals, right? You know, you, you're probably less excited about doing a trade that is counter trend than you are doing a trade that is with trend, basically, right? So, and then you might also have some fundamental or macro opinion about. So, you know, let's say, let's try and think of a view. So let's say it's something like, if you, were, if you wanted to buy Europe or something like that, but you were looking at the PMIs, say the PMIs in Europe were like turning south, yeah? But there was a dip in Europe. Uh, you liked what the currency was doing. You liked what, you know, the broader equity market was doing, but, but you know, the economic fundamentals were in the wrong direction, then you wouldn't be ticking all the boxes, basically, something like that, right? But the idea is if you're trying to construct a view, you want to look at all the different factors, and if they're all pointing and telling you the same thing, that this thing's a good buy, then your conviction might be higher, basically, that, that, that type of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah? But, you know, you've got to decide for yourself what all those boxes are that you want to tick, right? But basically, you, you want to try and build a framework where you have at least a handful of things that you look for to make you happy about going long or short an asset, yeah? And try and make those things a bit different from each other so that they're not just overlapping so that they're always going to agree with each other. And then when they do all agree, then you have a reason to feel a little bit more confident with your view, basically, right? Because there's lots of different angles that are all pointing to the same thing, yeah? So that, that, that would be the idea. So... Yeah, so once you've done this middle part and you kind of need to do this, I'd say for any, t any trade you do, yeah, then you go to the trade implementation part, right? So you've, you've got an idea of what your risk management and your risk reward and all that and the sizing, but then it's, there, are, there are various ways to implement the trade. So you could just go straight delta one, right, which is stock position or futures position, simplest type of thing. So you do delta one with a stop or you delta one without a stop if it's more longer term or asset allocation style. Now within that implementation, you, could, you can diversify. So we talked about this, I did this last week, right? So I wanna go short, wanna go tactically short equities, but you know, rather than just sell one asset in isolation, maybe do two or three assets that you like being short and diversify, right? So that's one way of implementing your trade, but maybe improving your sort of risk adjusted right um return because you've you've got some diversification in there right now obviously if you go for all assets that are 
super high correlated, then your benefits of diversification will be eroded. Yeah. But in general, you know, it's, if, if you can find a way to diversify your risk a bit so that all your eggs are not in one basket, then, then, it, then it usually helps, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. In my experience as well. And that kind of worked for me last week where I, I went short a bit of NASDAQ and a bit of DAX. I got stopped out on the NASDAQ. The DAX made some money. I then trailed my stop on the DAX and then got stopped out this morning, but didn't lose any money on the DAX leg. So I ended up being wrong being short equities for two days, but I lost less money because I diversified. Right? Um, then we talk about portfolio construction. I mean, that, that kind of similar point to diversification, right? So you think about, but this is more thinking about, you know, giving yourself limits, right? So in portfolio construction, you know, you can say, you know, you limit yourself so that not more than X percent of your equity is at risk in any one asset class, right? Or something like that. So you might say, you know, I am, I'm willing to, or like gold, for example, right? You, you might be looking at your longer term pension fund or your asset allocation. You might say, well, you know, my, my gold allocation is allowed to be anywhere between zero and 25%, but I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let any one asset go above 25% to control my risk, basically, right? So that's... Uh, that's ask you a question on portfolio construction. Sure. How would you know what percentage of asset to put in? So you said gold, you said 25%. Is yeah, that I, you, I, think it's a bit, I think it's a bit subjective, right? That, but, but, but the idea is about, you know, what... If you, it depends what your goals are, right? If, if you're trying to minimize the vol of your portfolio overall, yeah, then you need to have at least some minimum amount of diversification. So therefore your caps on allocation are going to be lower, right? So if you cap every asset class at 20%, then that means you will have a minimum level of, you will have a minimum level of diversification basically, right? If you want to be more aggressive and you say, I'm, I, I'll let an allocation get up to 50 if I really want to, then that means you're, you know, you're willing to take on less diversification, which means you're willing to take on potentially a higher vol of the overall portfolio, right? But having said that, maybe, maybe you're smarter about that and you say, well, I'm going to let that cap in my allocation be a function of the vol of the asset, basically, right? So maybe it will be a dynamic thing, and this is a bit more advanced, but you might say my allocation caps per asset class are a function of the volatility of the asset class. So if bond volatility is particularly low, my allocation in bonds could be 40%, right? But if the, if the volatility of bonds suddenly doubles, then that automatically brings my cap down to 20 and I get forced to reduce my allocation, yeah? And same story with all the other asset classes, basically, right? Yeah. So, so there's, all, there's all kinds of funky stuff you can do with portfolio construction. And, and, but it's just basically having a rules-based approach to asset class diversification and then even within asset class each individual expression needs to have a cap as well basically right so within equities you might say you know i'm a single stock i'm not allowed more than two percent allocation to one particular single stock yeah and that, that that type of thing yeah i mean that's kind of what i do in terms of my 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 pension fund i don't really let a single stock on initial on initial investment, I don't really let a single stock get bigger than a couple of percent, right, of, of the whole pot. Right. But with that type of strategy, I guess for the pension, you're playing a little bit safer, right? Um, but you kind of never really get exposed to those stocks that do like a mad 10x return then. Well, you get exposed, but you won't, that you, you won't be, your whole, your whole portfolio won't like go up 10x, no. But, but, but if you have if you have two percent allocated into a Tesla and it does ten x, then literally just off two percent of your entire portfolio, you've made a twenty percent return on your entire portfolio. You'll be pretty happy, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. But that, that's but the reality is, you know, you could have a shocker and Tesla drops by fifty percent, and you don't want your entire pot dropping fifty percent, yeah, or even half that, right? So. That's, that's why you do it that way, right? So that you, you'll lose 1% of your entire pot if it drops by a half, right? So, and then, and then the final, the, the, the little cherry on top in terms of trade implementation is options, right? So once, once you understand options, then you have 
such a great risk reward embedded within options naturally well that's when you buy them obviously um then you you basically have this kind of nice asymmetric profile where had you decided to top up say you had say you had maxed out your silver allocation in terms of delta one expression in your portfolio but now you're starting to see the chart on silver breaking out and you fancy there's a bit of a run coming there's you know you can you can you can say that over a total pot you might allocate five percent of your entire pot to option strategies and then within that five percent pot you might spend 50 basis points so a tenth of your total premium pot you might spend 50 basis points on some silver calls which have then gone and multiplied by a factor of 20 or even a hundred times what you paid for them. And that's your little, like I say, that's your kicker basically. Like that's the way to, that's the way to get your portfolio and supercharge it with these little lottery tickets around the place. That if you get those calls right, then you're making outsized returns off very small premium outlay basically. Right. And so, but most people don't know what options are or how to use them. So, but if you do know that, then it gives you an extra tool in your arsenal to basically really get those crazy convex payoffs that come from these moves that happen sporadically, right? I mean, I mean, this year's been a bit crazy, right? I'd say this year, but just off the top of my head, I can think of like five or six times where option, option payoffs, um, short dated options, like maybe within one month of expiry, have had like 100 to one payoffs, basically, right? I mean, that's pretty rare for that to happen so often, yeah? But this year has been a crazy year and, and it just keeps on doing it, right? So it's a bit, it's a bit mad, yeah. Um, and then, so, so, once, so that's your kind of trade implementation. And then you've got, and then you've got this kind of, I've, I've done this two-headed arrow to say, you know, you've got to constantly be reevaluating, right? So, so where, once you've got your trade implementation, you've got your risk management in place, you know, you, you can be continually monitoring data to evaluate your positioning, to, to check that you still agree with your positions and you still back your positions and they still reflect your view. So if your view is constantly evolving because it's a data-driven sort of view, then, you know, your views might change and then you would have to let that be reflected in your, your risk management or your trade implementation. And also trailing stops are a simple example of that, right? So when you've got a trade on and you've made some money, a form of sort of reevaluating to the new price of where you are, because obviously you did a trade and it had a risk reward, right? Of five to one when you did the trade. Now let's say you've made three or four times your money to all what the money that you were going to put at risk. The, the trade no longer has the risk reward that it started with, right? So you need to think about reevaluating that risk reward as it plays out. Yeah. And, and, and one way of kind of improving that is to trail your stops and, and things like that. Yeah. Imran, I, I read once um, in a Paul Tudor Jones interview that when he thinks about the positions that he already opened, he always uh, considered the previous closing price as his entry price for that specific position. Um, and would I put the trade on today, basically? Would I still put the trade on today? Yeah. Well, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a tough balance, that one, right? Because the truth is, you know, often if you think about it like that, you, you will often not run your winners for long enough, basically, right? I mean, the, 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 the golden ticket in trading is cut your losses quickly and run your winners for as long as possible. Now, if you, if you always trade out of your winners as soon as the risk reward goes down, you're never actually going to ever capture the maximum reward, right? So the risk reward was never right in the first place because you're always going to meddle with it too much. So I, I would argue that it's a, bit of a, it's, a bit of a it's a bit of a balance, right? You've got to be aware that the risk reward is deteriorating as you're making money, yeah? But you just kind of, for me, it's more about the risk reward deterioration should be something you're aware of and you're watching closely. Yeah. But it shouldn't be an automatic reason to exit straight away. You should be looking for ways to maybe restructure or really reevaluating your view hard to make sure you still truly believe in it. Right. Uh, 
I think of it that way. And, and that, again, I, I always bring it back towards options, right? Because that is what that is my bread and butter. And it's like options that options allow you very easily to make your risk reward better every time, right? So you buy a call option, it triples in value, you roll the strike up basically, right? Immediately you extract the money, you extract some money and you get your risk reward back to where it needs to be basically, right? So, so the great thing about options and being able to roll them and restructure positions in options is that you can stay on top of the, the risk management and the risk reward side really, really efficiently and really, really easily, right? Without having to overthink it too much, right? And 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 that's and it allows you to run your winners basically, right? Because you know it's a lot easier to say, okay, well, I've taken some money off the table, but I'll let some of it run just in case it keeps going, and it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. You you just run it for way longer than you ever would have been comfortable running it had it been a delta one position, basically, right? Because the the temptation to take it off was just too high, right? Yeah, so that, that's kind of, for me, that's, that's kind of my framework and how I sort of visualize and, and sort of think about trading and going from idea generation to actual implementation. And then, and then at the bottom, I've got that cloud of touchy-feely stuff, right, that is not so easy to, it's not tangible necessarily or as easy, right? But, you know, controlling your emotions is an important factor to think about. One way of doing that is having rule-based trading, yeah? And being a bit more systematic in your approach and when you actually do things that you have certain rules that you give yourself uh, obviously keeping track of your trades building a trading journal and, and, and also back testing your ideas is like saying you know this is a signal that I want to use and then you know go and actually test to see what the what the hit rate of that signal is and whether it's actually a worthwhile signal or not and you know, doing stuff like that will hopefully help you um, towards the final bit, which is finding your edge, right? So if you, when, you do, when you keep a trading journal and you do back test your ideas and your signals and what you're doing, and then you're intellectually honest about it and you don't kid yourself, so you don't like tell yourself something that's not actually backed up by the data, it's only then that you can truly find where your edge is, basically, right? But if you just kid yourself and like, say, oh, I'm just, I'm just amazing at calling the market, when actually you haven't back tested every time you call the market and seeing if your hit rate is above 60%, then you can't really say that to yourself, right? So, you know, until you start keeping track of your views and your ideas and what, you, what you're thinking, it, it's hard to know what your edge is, basically, right? And, and the truth is most of us don't have that great an edge in calling the market, right? But, you know, some people have an edge in just sort of, staying in trades for a long time like the asset allocation side and being patient and just picking companies that they expect to do well over the long run and just holding them forever and not caring too much about the volatility people like buffett for example some people have a more tactical edge that they're just good at feeling when the market is overdone one way or another um other people have edge in implementation like i think that my my edge is probably in in my use of options to implement trades um, because it's just become so sort of uh, second nature to me using options that, 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 that I have that natural asymmetry in the trades that I do because I'm generally an option buyer, right? And, and to be fair, if you bought an option every single day, you'd probably lose money. So it's about being, being good at buying options, knowing when to take the money out of options and knowing when to just stay and do nothing, basically, right? So that, that, that edge comes from being selective about when you actually do deploy your premium uh, and being able to restructure, monetize it and that, that, that sort of thing. Yeah.